Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us on Think Tech Hawaii. And do support us. Go to the website, Thank click you. the donate button, and whatever you feel you can share to help this continue these difficult conversations to make good trouble, thought-provoking, to help promote understanding in times that are divided, contentious, in which truthful information is under direct attack and serious challenge. Fortunately, one of the valiant warriors for truth is with us today, Larry Bridgesmith, my good friend, a professor at Vanderbilt University, head of guardrail technologies, legal alignment, mediator, law teacher, and truly well, well versed in both the risks and the benefits of technology and artificial intelligence. Larry, welcome. Delighted to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. Appreciate uh, the introduction. Thank you. And today we actually get to talk about uh, bringing access to justice to the people, all the people, uh, those on both sides of disputed issues. And Tennessee, thanks to Larry and a few others, has implemented a medical debt collection online dispute resolution program. Hey, Larry, tell us a little bit about that, how it came to be, what it looks like, what it does, why you like it. Well, it, it was a fascinating state of affairs in Tennessee when the reality of how medical debt in particular was creating a problem for both providers, the courts, the individuals who received medical services, but either wouldn't or couldn't pay the entirety of the debt. And so I was at the time the chair of the Alternative Dispute Resolution Commission, which is a Supreme Court commission that's created by the Tennessee Supreme Court to address alternative dispute applications. And the whole area of technology has always fascinated me, as has the area of dispute resolution. So you can sum up those two concepts, and that's what my career path has proven to be over time. But at this particular time, we had a organization in the state, the Sycamore Institute, which was a nonpartisan public interest group, that pointed out how seriously Tennessee was in arrears with respect to all the other states regarding how medical debt was being addressed. And it wasn't a pretty sight because out of the 95 counties in Tennessee, 93 of them had medical debt above the national average. That's not surprising in some of the more impoverished counties, but it was also true in the most wealthy counties. So it was in that vein that I began to think about and began talking with others about, how can we address that? And it was shortly after a mutual friend of yours and mine, Chuck, David Larson, had been hired to put a dispute resolution system into the courts in New York City, and it didn't work well. And his, his view on it was very well articulated in a law review article, which I would suggest is the template for doing these kinds of multi-stakeholder dispute resolution endeavors. And we followed it to a T. So my thanks to David, because he gave us the script. And it begins with having a clear understanding of who the stakeholders are. Who is everyone that can be affected by a change in the current system? So when we look at this particular problem, we obviously know that the medical care providers are interested parties. The lawyers that represent either the medical care providers or the debtors, the court system is a interested party because in this particular case, it was a huge burden on the court to have this large backlog of medical debt cases that completely clogged the system. And it was also an opportunity for the state's mediators to get involved. And so they were interested parties. So that's really where we began, Chuck, is to begin to identify 
the stakeholders. So I'll stop blabbing and uh, give you an opportunity to inquire about anything that I've just alluded to. So, how did you identify which stakeholders needed to be at the table? And how did you elicit leaders who were collaborative enough to come to the table to collaborate, well, not to compete? Yeah, you, you've spoken the, the work of a mediator, right? How do you convene any mediation? You have people who are in conflict with each other, and you have to help them understand that the status quo in their world is unacceptable. Help them embrace the fact that it cannot continue as it is, and then begin to help them open their minds to exploring satisfactory outcomes. So it was basically uh, the, the process of convening, language that we in the mediation community are very familiar with. So in this particular case, because I had a former student of a mediation course I taught at Vanderbilt Law, who was the youngest judge in the Tennessee judicial system in a chancery court in Tennessee, in Hamilton County, who had expressed these concerns to me. Obviously, I had an interested judicial official. So with that, I began to investigate. And he and I went to all of the various stakeholders in Hamilton County. Uh, we also took a very, um, collegial and collaborative approach, asking them what their concerns about the status quo was, how they would envision it differently if they could. And basically we convened a multi-party mediation, not in a formal sense, but our work with them was to try to help them come into the mediation process, even though it wasn't sitting down at a table. We were the interveners, if you will to help all of them examine their interests. So with that re in regard, one of the l largest, well, probably the largest healthcare medical provider in the county, Hamilton County was Erlanger Medical. And they had an enormous problem. They were writing off $25 million a year in bad medical debt. Well, that's a pretty significant interest. And when they write it off, what they do is they assign it to collection companies and they sell that debt for as little as a penny on the dollar. So somewhere between nothing and the medical debt maximums that patients owed would be a better outcome than the current status quo. So they were on board. We also then went to the legal aid community because they're responsibility is to represent those individuals who have no capacity to pay because legal aid is a pro bono legal service, we had to get them on board. And in the same way, we approached the legal aid local um, director of that office and brought her into the conversation. And then we, walked, we reached out to the mediation community in that county. So, with the, the imprimatur of the Alternative Dispute Resolution Commission of the Tennessee Supreme Court, a local judge, a local healthcare provider, and the legal aid community, as well as the court itself, we had the stakeholders surround the problem and then we began to address it by creating what was now recognized by our Tennessee Supreme Court as a, a successful initiative. They just recently issued their second report. The first was issued in 2021, indicating the degree of success to which it had been uh, recognized in Hamilton County. The second report just published last week indicates that not only was it an excess success initially, it has since continued to be a success to the point that the Tennessee Supreme Court said, we're ready to disperse this through other counties in the state. 
to help with their medical debt problems. So as a result, this is a proof of concept that was successful enough to now begin being replicated across the state. And is that an approach that you found beneficial, productive, the pilot project, proof in the pudding, and then show people this is what we can do? And they look at expanding it rather than trying a system-wide corrective measure from the beginning? Well, to that point, that was what David Larson experienced when he was asked from the top down to implement a judicial online dispute resolution system in New York City. He properly expressed to those who had hired him to do this work that we need to involve those who are going to be impacted. And the court system refused. They said, we know what's best. We're going to decide what it's going to be like, and they'll just have to live with it. Well, the net effect of that is we can pretty well predict the outcome when people have vested interest in the status quo, simply being told it's going to be different doesn't necessarily mean they'll like it. So we had to work with, and, and this is typical of multi-stakeholder disputes. This was a program, not a single dispute. So that took the whole uh, longevity of the process into view as well. This wasn't a single done one and done. This was a process that was implemented for the long term. And those were the kinds of concepts that the parties who had interests in this particular problem helped us resolve in a way that it could be sustainable over time. It, it wouldn't simply work if it were a one and done. It had to be created with a view to long-term solutions. So we've all seen and heard of situations, you know, Fox News and Dominion Insurance, where a very, very large, complex individual situations can be resolved by mediation. What did you do to take into account and try and tailor and customize your solution process so that it could be scalable and systematic? The answer to that depends as in all dispute cases, what is the nature of the issue? And, and who has the responsibility and are being negatively affected by it? So in this particular case, we had to hear from those stakeholders as to how the current system worked, which was about, you know, just we just roll the dice and take our luck in court. What that typically meant was the healthcare provider had to hire or retain attorneys to do this work. And most often what happened was a default. Well, you get a default judgment, you've got to enforce the default judgment. So that meant even more legal expenses, more time invested with still no outcome. And even if you got an enforcement against one of these debtors, they could possibly be judgment proof. So you've spent an enormous amount of money going after money that you may or may not ever receive. And the data suggested that this was not something that would work perpetually. And therefore, what did the process need to look like? So we knew that for people to be engaged, they had to be invited into a system that had its obvious superior value than the current system. So we created on a uh, dispute resolution platform, a notification system that began with the court clerk in Hamilton County deciding which cases seemed to be appropriate for referral into this system. And it's because it was online, it began with an email notice from the court to the individual and communications with the individuals and the healthcare provider 
by virtue of the way the system works on technology and the internet and through email was a permission-based exchange of information, meaning not every communication went to everybody. The initial invitation to participate was a means by which people who were in the debtor status were introduced to the system by virtue of a recording that appeared on the platform coming from the court. The judges who had the responsibility provided a short video to anyone who was invited into this process to affirm the trustworthiness of the process. And the impact of that increased the level to which people chose to engage. And once they chose to engage, they were given the opportunity to speak their piece as to why this particular medical debt shouldn't have been charged or, and why they wouldn't pay it. Could be medical error, could just be the inability to pay. But it opened up the negotiation process. And so at that point, the hospital could engage in a online asymmetric negotiation, meaning the hospital makes an offer to settle, the debtor makes an offer to settle, and perhaps at that level, it gets resolved. And it was frankly surprising how many were in fact resolved in that way. But the system also provided from the very get-go a free, no cost referral to a mediator that either the healthcare provider or the debtor could initiate by accepting the invitation and then a, a neutral was assigned, neutrals who had agreed to provide their services at no cost and they're versed in the way in which the system worked. And I'm talking about the technology platform as well as the, the law and the dynamics around medical debt. So you can begin to see how the system had to be developed in a way that accomplished all of those features and functions because just engaging in an email exchange was simply not good enough. There had to be a safe platform on which this negotiation and often mediation took place. So let me just give you, uh, as, as we take this a little bit deeper, how the report reflected the output of the effort and how the various interested parties, the stakeholders viewed the system. Because the um, Erlanger Health System provides the amount of debt that they had to begin with, in this case, 1.3 million. And the amount of debt for those who registered after being invited was 357,000. And then the amount of debt as registered without resolution was 121,000. And the amount of debt which reached a final resolution was 237,000. So the amount of debt that was resolved out of the 1.3 million was about 33%. So from the standpoint of the healthcare provider, this is a significant improvement over zero. Question. But I thought from the figures you just gave me, it sounded like two thirds of the cases were resolved rather than. Yeah, resolved, they were. Two thirds of the cases right. were resolved, but the amount of debt resolved was about uh -huh. a third of the total. So okay. to your point, the resolution can also be, you don't owe this money. So okay. that's two thirds were resolved, half of which resulted in the payment to Erlanger for some agreed sum. So they got 33 cents on the dollar instead of one. That's exactly right. Does that help? It, it does. A couple okay. of questions. Yep. What about your process motivated debtors 
to fund the payments that they made rather than seeking bankruptcy or otherwise avoiding payment? What changed their payment motivation, if it did? Well, that, that's going to be unique to each individual set of circumstances, but the large part of it is, I don't know if you've ever been on the receipt of a medical bill that you had no idea what you had agreed to pay before you got the invoice. Remember when we go in to receive a medical service, hospital or private physician, we sign an agreement, we're gonna pay whatever the insurance doesn't pay. We have no idea what that's going to be. So in one instance, my wife had an emergency and she was in intensive care and I signed the document. Of course, you're going to, you're not gonna get care otherwise. But when we got a $50,000 you owe us bill, we had to do something about that rather than simply write a check. So because I have the good fortune to have a law degree, we negotiated that down with the hospital and the physicians to nothing because there was a concern about medical error. But most medical debt recipients aren't as fortunate as I, and they don't know how to contest it but that doesn't mean they're bad people. Matter of fact, when you get that bill that shocks you, you, your first response typically is, how am I gonna pay this? So when the hospital reaches out and the court sanctions that contact and says, you may be eligible for this process that could address the medical debt that you have, would you be interested in pursuing it? And this is how it works. Again, it's not a large proportion because out of those invited, you can see the difference between those who accepted and those who were invited in terms of their medical debt. So you get the sense of the proportionality, but it's the debtor's choice to participate. This is purely voluntary. There is no coercion here. The court does not order them to participate. So people of good faith are gonna see this opportunity and make a decision. Is this something that we wanna be a part of? And you can see the proportionality of good faith debtors who want to take care of a problem and then engage in the process with some knowledge that it's not going to be what they owe. It may be something significantly less. Okay, So great answer. Me, let yeah, me, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to ask, is it your perception that your process made available information to debtors that enabled them to see a greater range of choices and the preferability of a negotiated mm -hmm. payment plan or resolution over Pre a litigated? Yeah, precisely right. There are resources on the opening page of the platform links that you can go to information about medical debt, information about resolution, information about mediation. Um, and, and they can be informed by virtue of the way the platform itself gives them access to information they would never have had app, uh, accessibility to prior. And therefore informs them before they choose to engage as to what it is that they're getting into. So the site itself, right off the top, has essentially an FAQ, frequently asked questions page, that educates the debtors who may not have an attorney, may not have any awareness of this stuff, may not have any idea that there are choices here for them and there may be resources for them and alternatives for them. Yeah, and, and the... But let me add to that, they are referred to, if they choose to do so, to the Legal Aid Society there in Hamilton County. Now, as you and I both know, very few people qualify for legal aid. I mean, of the 10% of the population who qualifies, legal aid can only uh, address the needs of about a percent. So the vast majority of people don't qualify, but they're given the information about how to contact legal aid and therefore they can find out for themselves if they can get that assistance. 
And in the process, they may receive information because we know that legal aid and other organizations, some charities like Catholic, Catholic Social Services and others, they have information available for debtors, whether it's tenants in eviction situations, debtors in medical debt, debtors in credit card debt. And there are debt counselors out there who have that information, resources that are available. And as you pointed out earlier, there is a lot of information and motivation for the creditors to see that this offers them an opportunity to a lot to do a lot better than one cent on the dollar in a resolution process, quicker and less expensively, and also without the outlay of expense. Any sense of how many of the creditors extensively use attorneys in this process and how many are able to do it themselves? Well, the creditors, particularly a health system like Erlanger, has its own in-house attorneys. Right. And one of them, when we put the system together, her sole responsibility was to deal with medical debt. So they have in-house assistants, but they are so skilled and they are so uh, progressive in their approach to medical debt that they also have an individual who's not an attorney who works as that facilitator. And with her oversight, she's able to decide which ones should be referred in the first place, which ones don't stand much of a chance of success and therefore go some other route. Uh, and they still have attorneys outside that in some cases will file lawsuits and pursue recovery, but they do far, far less of that than they did before. Uh, let me let me share with you a, a couple of other reactions from the other stakeholders, and then we can go a little bit deeper into process if you wish. Because this is the legal aid office in Hamilton County about how satisfied they are. It, it, the, the vision is in East Tennessee where justice is a community value and no one faces a legal problem alone. This online dispute resolution project serves that vision. I mean, that's high praise from people who are charged with dealing with the downtrodden and the, the uh, economically challenged. And then the court itself, this was my mediation student at Vanderbilt Law. This was this, the sponsor of this within the court system. It's, it speaks to the appreciation of the work done, but it also speaks to the reduction of an enormous backlog that they now no longer have to deal with and they are supportive of expanding this program elsewhere in the state. And then our mediation community, Steve Shields is a close friend of mine. He's um, the chair now of the Alternative Dispute Resolution System. And he talks about this as a great development for the mediators because it's one, an opportunity to get lots of experience. And if they're willing to, the only condition is that they won't do it for pay. They'll do it on a voluntary basis. And the initial group of 17 mediators was phenomenal in one county. So the mediators were very satisfied, as was the Supreme Court, because now they're projecting taking this same system throughout the state to other counties that have the same problem. So let me ask a couple of things. One is for the beneficiaries, the debtors, the creditors, the court systems, but you've got a fourth community in there that's providing a valuable service for which they have training and experience and there is expense, time and money to them. You've got creditors who are substantially multiplying their recovery on medical debt, who are well-funded creditors. Is there, in your view, 
a potential that there may be movement for paid mediation services, recognizing that financial reality? Well, I, I certainly think there's a potential. I'm, I'm not suggesting that there is none. And the more successful this becomes, the more the, e the economic beneficiaries of the system, which include the individuals, it includes the hospital or the provider of medical services, the whole system could be adjusted by the court to require some payment for a mediation participant, whether that's state funded or funded by the participants remains to be seen. I mean, all state budgets are terribly constrained, so the likelihood of that is not that great. But in this particular case, uh, I wrote a, a grant request to the State Justice Institute for $50,000 in order to set this whole system up, you know, acquire the technical assistance of a platform generator primarily. So there are grant monies that can be dedicated to this. So if, if every mediator who is only doing this on their own time, they're not spending a day in a mediation room, they're doing it in an asynchronous manner, maybe they would be willing to take $100. I don't know what the right number is, but it's certainly more than feasible. And I would certainly hope that it becomes to that degree uh, a possible revenue source for the mediators themselves. And I raise that because a good friend, Roger Moss, who has instituted an amazing eviction mediation rapid relief program in San Francisco that's now funded by the Bar Association and others, and Tracy Wilkin, the Mediation Center of the Pacific Director here, who has initiated a rapid response eviction mediation program that initially was legislatively funded when the pandemic relief ended, and now is actually privately funded to the extent it is. They're actually paid mediation services for those. They're also the volunteer ones, which some of us provide. But we're looking at a situation where exceptionally well financially resourced sectors and organizations and companies, whether it be healthcare institutions and insurers, property owners and insurers, um, credit card companies and finance companies, others, would appear to have the resources in which some allocation of the expense of the benefit that they receive might make sense to be worth considering. Roger took that into account, said, look, eh, the second thing is for the mediators, for those 17 Hamilton County mediators, as they become known, to the medical debt collection creditors community and the others that they work with, they're going to get clients. They're going to get cases referred to them that don't need to necessarily go through the free program. Maybe it's a larger, more complicated case. Maybe it's one where there's a threat of medical malpractice, but there's a big medical bill. They really need full-on qualified trained commercial mediator services. So. And those are the cases that are going to pay more anyway. To give what is likely in most of these cases, any estimate of the amount of time the mediators put in, three to five hours, maybe, something like that? Oh, I, the information that I have received from these mediators, of course, that still is confidential. We, we don't know. There's no record. But the feedback that I've received from them, it's typically no more than an hour a week that they spend doing these sorts of asynchronous mediation efforts. So it's a modest amount of time. And as you say, they're getting known by a community who respects their work. And it's going to be a referral source for other much more highly paid 
mediation uh, activities. And they're building niche expertise, which is transferable to other areas. If you can do medical debt collection, you can do credit card debt collection. You can do landlord tenant debt collection. You can, you know. So and I I've, I've been training mediators for 20 years. Uh, we have a program here in Tennessee that you uh, qualify to be a mediator listed by the courts. And the first questions they always ask is how can I get experience? Because without experience, you have no reputation in the marketplace. You have no referral source. So now, in addition to being able to say to them, well, check with your local community mediation center, because you can get great experience there as a volunteer. And now I can also say, well, you need to check this program because it'll, it requires mediators to do so on a far less time-consuming basis, and hopefully at some point with a degree of modest compensation. Well, we're out of time for today, but Larry Bridgesmith, thank you so much. If ever there were an example of serving access to justice in a win-win-win-win combination for the debtors, the creditors, the courts, and the mediators, this is a wonderful example. And the relatively modest cost to Tennessee to set this up and get it going compared to the benefits for all of those involved, including its court systems, exponentially wonderful return on investment. Larry Bridgesmith, thank you so much. Think Tech Hawaii, thank you for joining us and aloha. Aloha. <laughs>